And we'll have as our quote to set the stage, a quote from John Calvin himself. He wrote, do not fail to rid the country of those zealous scoundrels who stir up the people to revolt against us. Such monsters should be exterminated as I have exterminated Michael Severitus, the Spaniard. As I have exterminated Michael Servetus. Oh, the Spaniards. He stirred up a rebellion. You know what he did? He preached it was wrong to baptize babies. And Calvin's defenders often say, uh, that's unfair. Calvin had nothing to do with this execution. It's not what he said. He said, as I have exterminated. He's calling on them to exterminate others. Yeah. Yeah. Now, and, and we'll get to this. I'll say, well, he kicked him out of town first and he came back. Okay, that's true. He still put him to death for what he believed about the Bible. Calvin wrote, one should not be content with simply killing such people, but should burn them cruelly. It is not just enough for them to die. They have to die a public, slow, painful death in order that people can be taught how terrible what they did was. So I said credit where credit is due. And I've tried to be fair and nice to Calvin when I could. When we get into this subject, the only thing I can think of is blame where blame is due. There is no defense for Calvin on this subject. And, and um, you have a lot of Baptists running around calling themselves Calvinists. And I say, do you really want that label? The label of the man who put your forefathers to death? That, that's, that's not a theological debate about which good men are having a difference. He believed that throughout his life he was following a great dedication, God's will, and was the faithful defender of truth. As a pastor of Geneva, he saw his role as purging the city of immorality of all kinds. His method was to use the civil government as an arm of the church. His method was to use the civil government as an arm of the church. To establish correct and strict laws of behavior, but also as executing judgment and punishment of offenders. It's helpful in understanding Calvin's actions that as a senior minister of Geneva, it was his obsession to purify the citizens from all immoral behavior. He thought that applying the law of Moses was the solution to the problem of sinful behavior. However, in looking at the actions of John Calvin, it can be plainly seen that his theology was based on Augustinian thought and was administered as a tyrannical, vindictive, in a tyrannical, vindictive, cruel, and unloving way. It's difficult to find in the many hundreds of books written about John Calvin, many instances of him being a loving, kind, merciful, or caring man or pastor. He ruled and lorded over his congregation and using the civil authorities brought swift judgments on dissenters, even unto death. By, by way, the way, you won't read in a Calvin's books any place that he talks about the love of God for man. Because you can't tell all men in his mind that God loves them. It may have been his pleasure to have damned them to hell. By 1538, Calvin was forced to leave Geneva because of his unpopular views. Later in 1541, he was invited back. He was at first reluctant to return because of the opposition he'd faced. What changed his mind 
was that governing, those governing the city offered him lucrative benefits and position if he would return. The city was in turmoil. They offered Calvin great power that he could exercise in his new office as the minister to Geneva. Their aim was to restore order in the troubled city. The power would allow him to establish discipline, control behavior throughout the city. Calvin drafted certain ecclesiastical ordinances which created the constitution for the reformed church of the city-state of Geneva. The consistory, one of three governing bodies of the city, has the jurisdiction over the enforcement of Calvin's laws. Calvin set about in earnest to remolding Geneva into a city of God. That's a book, title of a book by Augustine, The City of God. Harkness states it was the duty of the state Calvin thought to use its powers, if need be, its sword-bearing arm to enforce moral living and sound doctrine. By sound doctrine, of course, we mean agreeing with me. According to Harkness, before his death, Calvin became virtually the civil as well as the ecclesiastical dictator of Geneva. Calvin's grave error was in thinking that he, by applying civil law, he could change the moral condition of the citizens of Geneva. Like every attempt to legislate morality, it miserably failed. If he had truly been a man of God, he would have sought to bring spiritual revival to the city by preaching the saving gospel of Jesus Christ as the only way to change the sinner's nature and life. He didn't have to preach the saving gospel because those who were predestined to be saved were going to be saved. And those who were lost were going to be lost. So he had to try to find some way to control the behavior of the lost. When the sinner repents of his sins, God changes his nature and he becomes a moral and spiritual person. Calvin could not have understood 2 Corinthians 5, 17, which says, if therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And had taken the misguided course he pursued. The truth of the character of Calvin can be seen in the heretic Michael Servetus and others who were accused of violating his laws. Severitus was a scholarly theologian and a renowned physician. He was condemned as a heretic both by the Roman Catholic Church as well as the Protestants for his rejection of the Trinity and infant baptism. He rejected infant baptism, for which he is correct in his arguments, the grounds were very solid. He rejected the doctrine of the Trinity, for which he was very wrong. Severitus published a book titled The Errors of the Trinity, in which he refuted those who believed in the Trinity as believing in three gods. He and Calvin corresponded for some time, but Severitus would not accept Calvin's teaching on the Trinity. Calvin, having failed to convert Severitus, became vindictive and saw him as his devoted enemy. On February 13, 1546, Calvin wrote to his friend Farrell, if he comes to Geneva, I will never let him go out alive if my authority has wait, excuse me, for seven years. Calvin sought to capture and try Severtus. When Severtus made the mistake of returning to Geneva and attending one of Calvin's services, he was recognized and arrested and put on trial. Calvin wrote that he hoped the verdict in Severtus' trial would be the death penalty. Again, Calvin's defenders say, he didn't have anything to do with this. He, he was the preacher. This was the government doing this. He was the preacher who was the virtual dictator of Geneva. This was his program and his plan. You cannot make him innocent in this. You cannot compare it to the law and order that we have in our cities today. Okay. Calvin got his wish, and Severitus was convicted of two of the 18 charges brought against him. He was sentenced to be burned at the stake along with his books. On October 27, 1553, his sentence was carried out. Outside of Geneva, he was taken to Hill, and Nig records that a wreath strewn with sulfur was placed on his head. When the faggots were ignited, a piercing cry of horror broke from him. Mercy, mercy, he cried. For more than half an hour, the horrible agony continued, for the pyre was made of half-green wood, which burned slowly. Jesus, Son of the eternal God, have mercy on me, 
the tormented man required, uh, cried from the midst of the flames. It should be noted that Severitas was not a citizen of Geneva, but was only visiting the city. Thus, the misdirected piety of John Calvin claimed another victim. Under Calvin, Anabaptists were cruelly prosecuted. He saw them as his adversaries. He saw people like us as his adversaries, mainly because they rejected infant baptism and his unbiblical beliefs and practices. A man named Jacques Cret, who was a confessed atheist, was accused of writing a poster against Calvin of accusing him of hypocrisy and hanging it on his pulpit. In his crime, he publicly disagreed with John Calvin. He was arrested and tortured until he admitted to his crime. He was then executed by beheading on July 26, 1547, because he spoke out against the tyrant of Geneva, John Calvin. That's the hero whose name you want to take? This and many other atrocities were conducted under the direction of John Calvin and clearly show the man was a religious fanatic, a criminal, and a murderer. What makes his action so vile is that he committed those heinous atrocities in the name of Almighty God and under the banner of upholding the truth. These people were not condemned for viable crimes, but because of superstitions, speaking their opinions, or holding beliefs that John Calvin disagreed with. Now, again, you watch this. Was, oh, so I'm not a Calvinist, I'm reformed. John Calvin did this through the agency of the reformed church. They mean the same thing. Calvinist and reformed mean the same thing. When you call yourself a Calvinist, you are identifying with the cruel persecutions and, and the war against religious liberty that took place under the part of John Calvin. When you call yourself reformed, you're doing exactly the same thing. People ask me, are you, are you Calvinist? No. So, well, you're reformed. No. See, the reformers put my Baptist forefathers to death. That is not just something I disagree with. That is something I take pretty seriously. That, that's not a theological dispute over a point. I, in spite of some good things that they did, I refuse to think of these people as heroes. Okay. Judging him by his deeds, going back to Pastor Cooper, and his warped sense of Christianity reveals that Calvin was completely devoid of human kindness and mercy. He certainly had no hint of having the love of Christ in his heart, showing no love for his fellow man. Can you imagine looking at a person who's burning at the stake you have just ordered okay you weren't the only one ordering the city council voted for it you approved it can you imagine looking at another human being that you were going to send to be burned at the stake because of the terrible crime that they disagreed with you. I could not do that to an animal. See, it's life taken that way. Can you imagine the mental process that makes you think you are doing that and because you are doing that, you are doing the will of God that your opinion is so important that anybody who disagrees with it could justifiably be burned at the stake. Okay. Calvinists, not in your life. 
reformed, not for a minute. Not in the record of Baptist churches is there one example of Baptist sending anybody to their death because they disagreed with us. We preach the Baptist distinctives zealously. We enforce them as a condition of membership in our church, which means if you don't believe them, you can't be a voting member in our church. But you can still spend tomorrow any way you want to spend it. There is nothing in the Baptist record of any Baptist ever in the name of what we believe putting anyone to death, imprisoning anyone, uh, fining anyone, beating anyone. We have a, a great heritage as Baptists. I would never mix that heritage by say, a Calvinist Baptist or a Reformed Baptist. Reformers used to put Baptist to death. I don't know about you, but I take that personally. I consider that more than a minor mistake. Especially the new Calvinists will tell you, we're not Calvinists, we're Reformed. So what in the world is a Reformation? I mean, men will candidate for the pastor of churches, and they'll say, are you a Calvinist? I say, no. Then they start preaching predestination. So you said you weren't a Calvinist. I'm not a Calvinist. I'm Reformed. Teachers will teach in Bible colleges. And they'll sign a statement that says they're not Calvinist. And they start teaching the five points of Calvinism. And they'll say, well, I'm not a Calvinist. I didn't get those from Calvin. I'm Reformed. I got them from the Reformation. It's dishonest and deceptive. They always knew when they signed those statements, made those promises, they were not being honest.